in God's infinite wisdom and mercy, I believe at times he will either place us in a valley or we get off the trail and we end up in a valley and sometimes the devil will tempt us into a valley. It doesn't matter what the cause is. And I can tell you that the reason why I'm targeting this is because I, I was thinking to myself, I'm quite sure that there are people listening to me, whether you're in the building here or wherever you are in the world, that are feeling like their trials and their darkness are not going away, their prayers are not being answered. Now, I don't want cameras on anybody, but let me just ask you this. Have you ever prayed for God to do something? And in your eyes, he's done nothing, right? So this is why I say to you it's important to kind of touch on what I'm going to do today. I'm going to take you to a passage, not Psalm 84, but I'm going to take you to a passage that visits a concept which is deeply tied into blessed men go through valleys of weeping in that sometimes things come into our life out of our control. And it's necessary to understand, at least in part, not only what we can understand about these things, but also how we may benefit. You know, there's always two ways to deal with something. You can deal with something in perplexity and confusion and frustration, or you can deal with things in faith. And that brings me to where I'm going to take you today. And that's going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at one more time the ministry of the thorn, or what I've called the problem of pain, and what we'll also call seemingly un unanswered prayer for right now. And I would like you to turn there, if you have a Bible, uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And while you're turning there, I'm going to talk a little bit more. We know that there are promises in this book that say there is nothing too hard or too impossible for God. But you actually have to start with Believing that. No, a lot of Christian faith stands or falls on understanding why this book is so important. It's not just a collection. In this case, 2 Corinthians is a letter to the Corinthians. And as I've said many times, we have 1 and 2 Corinthians, and I'm sure there was 3 and 4, which we don't have, corrective letters to the church. But it's vitally important to understand this cannot just be read as a collection of stories, or in this case, Paul's telling of events. It also has to be a little bit of a mirror. So when I'm reading something about what I'm going to read right now, I should be able to look at what's going on, and if I don't exactly see myself, I should see some dimensions of instruction that will be helpful for me as I too, and I'm going to tell you, you as well, will not find yourself immune to these types of situations, whether it be a valley of weeping or buffetings sent by Satan. So, what should we say in a time of trouble when we pray and we ask God for help? We ask him to help us, fix us, heal us, guide us, direct us, all of the, we'll call them imperatives, we direct towards him in desperation, mind you. Sometimes I've prayed for people who were sick. Sometimes I've prayed with such great assurance, God, the great physician, will enter in. And other times I've prayed in desperation. I've prayed, this is probably going to sound weird, but I've prayed probably not full of faith, but in complete desperation because my prayers of previous on the same note had not been answered. And I'm told that God answers prayers. So now I come to a disconnect. If God answers prayers, why didn't he answer mine? Now, there'll be people out there who are unfortunately not well versed in the Bible and maybe they don't even believe the book. They'll say, well, the reason why, plain and simple, is because you're praying to a non-existent entity. That's their simple answer for you. God doesn't exist. Or if he does, why would he answer you? Or, I mean, I can give you the litany of the way people would approach silence from God. But I think a lot of times when God is silent, he's not answering, there's been no action, a lot of times we have to stop 
and we need to start listening. Seems to me a lot of times we are very quick to talk to God and tell Him what He must do, but we don't do a lot of listening from the book. I know that's weird because we read, we don't listen, but listening to what's in the book to be able to let God guide us and let us see what it is God desires to show us. How many times have you said to yourself, I wonder what God is trying to show me here? You ever said that? I've said that many times. I wonder, what is the lesson? And I can't see it. And many times I haven't even seen the lesson. I don't even know what it was. But the fact that I uttered, there's got to be something here God's trying to show me, speaks volumes. It means imperfect. I'm not always on the amen apex of life, but at the same time, I see God's hand can be in all situations. As I said in my opening comments, God does enter into all things, so there must be something God is doing, even if I don't hear or I don't see. And that's why I take you to this passage, familiar about the Apostle Paul, um, because he opens this 12th chapter, and there was no chapter and verse, but I'm using that as a frame of reference. He opens the 12th chapter by opening his heart and sharing with his intended readers something that happened to him, and from that, kind of a cause and effect. So let me start. I'm going to read through this um, all but perhaps maybe 11 or 12 verses of the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing I am behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Now, we know how these people viewed the Apostle Paul. In several different places, they say that his appearance was not that great, that he appeared weak. But there's one thing I want to kind of set from the get-go which is many people, and I've taught on this every time I've taught from this passage, many people believe that when Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, first of all, let's clarify the word thorn in the Greek is not a thorn that you would encounter on a rose bush. The word in the Greek for thorn is essentially the word that would be used when they impale a person before they crucify them. So the first thing that comes to my mind of this passage, strangely enough, are the words of Christ out of Matthew 16, where he says, if any man would follow me, essentially, actually, the King James says that, but if you read the Greek, it says, if anyone, placing it genderless, if anyone should follow me, let him or her take up his cross or her cross and follow me. Failure to pick up your own cross is essentially saying you will not. And what is that? The great debate that people often discuss, what, what did Christ mean by that? I will tell you, for each individual, it is different. For every individual, your cross is not the same as mine. It could be, but chances are it's not. Because that, I put in a category of 
understanding what the cross is when I've many times referred to the rich young ruler. Maybe in his case, his cross was his, his riches, possibly. I'm saying to you, this is what comes to my mind here. Same concept. In fact, what's even more interesting is it says here that Paul, he, um, he besought the Lord three times that it might depart from him. So we get an understanding that this buffeting, this thorn that he was enduring, when it says it, he prayed for it to depart, at some point he stopped praying about it. At some point he settled the matter that God was not going to take this away. And then there's this interesting and hard to deal with concept, which I'm going to tell you exactly what it says here, but it's hard to deal with and it's hard to understand because of the nature of how we process things. But think of it this way. When it says, was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. But wait a minute. Isn't the Apostle Paul a man chosen by God for ministry? Wasn't he raised up for that? So the big question, which we almost have to wrap our minds around, is that essentially God let this messenger of Satan. God essentially lifted the hedge, but equally I'd say God ordered it. It wasn't just simply that Satan attacked him. You know, that's a tough thing to wrap your mind around because we view Satan in a certain light, but not difficult to understand if you juxtapose it over the book of Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Not difficult at all to understand the conversation that went on between God and Satan in Job's time, which essentially is the same thing we're looking at in the same dimension. Now, God could have done, he could have used any method, but this method alone, you know, might leave a lot of us scratching our heads, this poor man who is being tormented. Now, many people have said that his issue was ophthalmia. Now, I, I've, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it, I hope, in a way that makes it even more abundantly clear. His issue was not ophthalmia. And I would be willing to place, uh, place it all in the bank of heaven to say, whoever came up with that idea and has perpetuated it doesn't, hasn't really read this passage properly. Because the reason why something was sent to buffet him, it says, lest he should be exalted above measure... What the visions that he saw, lest he become so puffed up that he had this, that he was chosen to have these experiences. So there was a need to keep his feet to the ground. Now let me let me just say this, because I've seen this in ministry so many times. God does something which we cannot explain. You can't explain it. You can't. You, there's no way to rationalize it. You know it has to be God that did this certain thing, but. We can't help but want to take a little bit of credit. We can't help. What I'm saying is true. Whether you want to admit it or not, that's the way we are. That is the power of the flesh. We tend to, if something really blissful and blessed happens to us, we tend to gloat a little bit. That's our nature. Now, if you say no, you're full of it. (laughs) Okay? That's our nature. I, I just say it like it is. If you say Well, I'd never take credit for that. Really? That's the flesh. And the flesh is very strong. The flesh says, I want to be recognized. So it's very clear. The reason why I say not ophthalmia, people get that idea that he had some eye problem because in Galatians, the closing of Galatians says, see what a large, what large letter I've written with my own hand. People have interpreted that to mean he wrote large letters because his eyesight was poor. But let me just say it makes no sense. Because if you remember, when Paul encountered Christ on the Damascus Road, he, was, he temporarily lost his sight. He was blinded. And we have a clear description that he could not see for several days. So if it was an eye problem... My guess is somewhere in this book we would read about Paul praying for God to heal his eyes. But let's just go with this. If he had ophthalmia, if his eyes were bad, if they were weepy, if he had some type of eye disease, how would that, how exactly, if Christ is in your heart and you've been delivered as a Jew, Saul, to heralding the gospel, how could your poor eyesight humble you? 
in that day, medical care wasn't like we have today where you can go and you can have LASIK done if you have eye problems. If you had bad eyes, you had bad eyes. And if you lost your sight and you were blind, you were blind, period. So in many ways, when people had less eyesight or were blind, they were considered even more spiritual because they had to rely on other senses. But it makes no sense to me to say he saw these visions, he saw what he saw, and let me just say, I'm saying the words deliberately. He saw what he saw and heard what he heard, which tells me his eyes were not messed up and neither were, her, were his ears. So when somebody says ophthalmia, let me go back and read this for a second because he says, when he says, he can't say whether it was in or out of the body, but essentially carried up to the third heaven, caught up into paradise, heard unspeakable words. So he, he saw and heard. That doesn't sound like a man who's got an eye problem. Now, maybe he did have an eye problem, but I guarantee you, being as familiar with Paul's writing, this has to be something else. And I've told you what I have said over time, over and over and over again, because it's so abundantly clear to me. You go back into the 7th and 8th chapters of the book of Acts, and you read that Saul, who becomes the apostle Paul, before he encountered Christ on the Damascus Road, was a persecutor of the church. He went into people's houses, dragging men and women, Christian men and women, dragging them out of their house and bringing them into prison. Now he becomes a herald of the church, preaching the gospel. You don't think that that, the memory of what he did, would haunt him? Because I believe it would. I believe anyone, I believe a man like I've mentioned many times, Zacchaeus, greedy, desirous of just having, taking, stealing, robbing from people, has an encounter with Christ, is radically changed from that encounter, and then says, if I've robbed anybody, I, I will repay them, and fourfold, I believe he says. In any event, the point that I'm saying is it's imperative to look at this and understand that Paul's thorn, whatever it was, was designed to keep him humble, and the, when I say feet on the ground, you know how easy it is when you hear people give testimonies? Well, the Lord did this for me. And if he did this for me and he did this thing, he'll do it for you. Well, no, it's, it, you know, God will do a lot of things. But does he do the same things all over the place? No, and not in the same way either. So that can bring somebody to become a little bit boastful or proud about their experience. So I'm sure that in this case, when it says a thorn in the flesh... We have to be uh, clear about what this means and what it means for us as well, not just understanding this passage. How do we apply it? So first I'm going to say it's very interesting. When you go back in the Gospels, you read about Christ in the garden, Garden Gethsemane, and he's praying. And he prayed several times, but we have it recorded for us in most of the Gospel records Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And we know that the cup was left for Christ. It was not removed. Well, the cup for Paul was not removed either. God did not remove that thorn. That would be with him for the rest of his life. In fact, if you read the word, the verb for buffeting, which is uh, more of a punching or an assault, it is ongoing, it's active, it's present and active, which means he, he was suffering this on an ongoing basis. It wasn't sporadic, it was ongoing and would be with him for the rest of his life. I put this in the same category as Jacob being crippled. He would limp for the rest of his life. When we start to get these lessons and they become more and more clear, we, we can start to apply them to ourselves because that's what the Bible's for. The Bible's not just to study and read a chapter and verse and maybe memorize it. It is to try and understand what on earth does God want me to do when this happens or when that happens or how should I react? You know, there's, there's a concept that says, well, if God hasn't removed the cup, maybe God doesn't care about you. Not so fast. Because as I said, God did not remove, the Father did not remove the cup for the Son, didn't remove it for his chosen vessel, Paul, 
and will probably not remove it for you or for me. So it, it's very important for us to examine this text to better understand what we should glean out of this for us, for our growth and for our understanding. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say to you, I want you to notice something. It says that he prayed three times that it might depart. And then it says in the ninth verse, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's almost as though, and I'm not saying it's like what I'm going to say, but it's almost as though Christ was standing in the shadows, not making himself visible or apparent or known, while Paul was praying and pleading. It's almost as though Christ is standing in the shadows because he's saying all this, and then my grace is said to him. My grace is sufficient for thee. So I want to say, just as we may be in a circumstance where we feel we're being buffeted and we're going through a trial, don't think because God hasn't answered your prayers yet that God is not present with you and not seeing what you're going through. Because that's the other common thing we tend to do. When the trials come, we immediately, I don't know what it is, like we take a stupid pill and we think, oh, God must not see this. He's not here. So, um, I want to talk about a few things to better understand. As I've said, the thorn is not some rose garden variety. And look at where the thorn is. It's in the flesh. Now, the flesh is already weak, but you notice he doesn't say, the way he says it is quite particular. And that's why I said to you, I do not believe. If somebody were to ask me, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kill this, it's already a dead horse, I'm just going to go for it one last time. If somebody said to me, it's his eyes, I'd say to you, you know, I have, sometimes I have things like you've seen me, I've told you, I have mystery things that come upon me headaches, nausea, vomiting, no one can explain for many, many years. No one's been able to explain. I might say maybe that's my thorn for me. Maybe that's that thing that I don't understand that comes upon me that is complete, can debilitate you for 24 to 72 hours. It comes on randomly. I don't know why. I've been to every doctor. No one can tell me what it is, so I just accept. It is a part of my life, and I'm starting to change the way I see it. Maybe it's my thorn. I don't know. I'm sure I have other thorns, unfortunately, but that may be one of them. But the first thing I want to tell you that is interesting about this is from the eighth verse where he says, I besought the Lord thrice. Prayer. And for the Christian, we should never stop praying, even if it is something we, we're not quite sure. Would God answer this prayer? Is this something God will remove? We should not stop praying. I told you, at some point, we know Paul stopped praying about this. He understood in some way, shape, or form that this was something designed to keep him in check, to keep his flesh in check. Not him, but his flesh. So that's the first thing. Prayer is always important, um, but we have to come to the place of really understanding that sometimes these things, that whether they come at the hand of God or they come at the hand of Satan... God's given us a method and a way. And this is the unfortunate. This is why I said it, it. Sometimes, personally, I get so frustrated because everything that will happen, almost, and I say almost, I don't think there's anything that God, that we're going to have happen to us that God hasn't seen happen before. We're not like we're the first. So why is it that we can't, when we, we realize that this is our circumstance, how is it that we have such trouble coming to the right mindset, which is listening and hearing, and maybe for us we won't hear Christ speaking into our ears audibly, but we can put these words engraved into our hearts, my grace is sufficient for thee. And I want you to see the juxtaposition, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I think a lot of people don't grab hold of this. When I am weak, when I have been brought to be emptied, I have been trying, striving, endeavoring, and now I'm drained, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. When I have come to the end of my energy in the flesh is when I can become strong in the spirit. You cannot be 
strong in the flesh and strong in the spirit at the same time. It's never going to work. They're at war against each other. So the first thing that I would like us to look at is that verse 9 that basically explains something. When people hear about weakness, there is an automatic tendency to not want to be weak, to not want to be seen as weak. Oh, let me ask you, who here wants to be seen as weak? Anybody? Any takers? Going once, going twice, three times, gone. And that's because our nature, that is part of, I hate to say it, it ties back into pride, ties, ties back into a lot of things. We don't want to be seen as weak. But I ask you, if you carefully look at the disciples of Christ, prior to the Spirit being poured out, they had moments of understanding, but they were weak men. And they were not weak men because they followed another man. Any man or woman who thinks that if you are following, and I'm now talking biblically, if you're following God, that somehow to be a follower is weak. No, actually, it takes incredible strength in the spirit to stay connected, to keep following, because the flesh will always creep out and say, oh, I don't want this. I want to be free. How many times have you, if you're going to be honest with yourself, and if I'm going to be honest with me, in our moments of insanity, desired to be cut free because in some insane thought, we thought, well, we're, we're, we're bound. And the reality is, no, you come to Christ, you are bound in the world. Christ frees you. See, we see everything upside down. Coming to Christ is not like some people view it as, well, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be in a monastery now. No, it's liberating because now you can become who God intended you to be, not the person that you have been that basically has created more messes and more disasters, but you'll probably still create messes and disasters as a Christian, except you'll be doing it the way God wants you to do it. <laughs> Simple enough, right? Okay, that was my humor, but to be serious, though, the reality is that here we have some great instruction. And he says, Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, verse 9, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, may tabernacle upon me. So I'm going to tell you the other word, the first word I gave you is prayer. The second word is out of that ninth verse, power, which is dunamis. We get our word for dynamite for it. I'd rather, that, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ, the dunamis of Christ, may tabernacle upon me. That tells you and reinforces another concept which is, if his weakness was simply his eyes, wouldn't he say that Christ may heal my eyes? There's something so disconnected if you can't see what the thorn is. And it can't, as I said, cannot be an eye problem. But he says, I'd rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may terrible knuckle upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Now, I don't think I did this before. So if you, if you have a pen and you're not doing any harm to your Bible... It'll help you when you study this in the future. I want you to circle in verse 10 the words in, I-N, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. He says, therefore, I take pleasure. There's my third P. We have prayer, power, and pleasure. Now, I'm going to tell you I'm not there. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not there. I'm not, I haven't yet arrived to, to, to glory in... Let, let me go back and read that again. Take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distress. I'm not there yet. Anybody there? <laughs> okay, it's an honest morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I, I just ask you to take note of this. We are often reading in the Bible being in Christ and the power of Christ in us and the hope of glory in us. When he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, God help me to get there. That when the troubles come and when the persecutions come and when the distresses come, that I can take pleasure. I'm not even sure. Let's just even say if I could praise God for it. Say, thank you, God. I'm so grateful you, you let this or this happen to me. You know, usually, 
The funny thing is, you can honestly say that after the fact. You know when something's over? Praise God, right? Something's over and it's behind you? Oh, thank God that's over. So what do we pray? A lot of times, what do we do? If we were having this issue of the thorn, we would be praying, take it away, God, take it away. I can't stand it. I can't function. I can't deal with it. Take it away. But God clearly said, nope, not doing it. See, God knows something about our nature that we don't. That if we were left to our own devices, I could just imagine Paul being carried up and uh, not just this vision that he saw of the third heaven, but the many different things, having an encounter with the risen Christ. All of these are what I'd call ingredients for a recipe of a, a very proud, boastful person. They might have followed Paul around. Remember when they touched just the rags to his body, and then they said that these rags healed other people. Now, today you've got a lot of charlatans on TV that will tell you, send away for your, for your, um, for your healing rag. But you can see how somebody who has, we'll call it the the special eye of God looking upon him, how that could have lifted him up. So I say to you, it's important for us to understand why he's saying, I take pleasure in all these things for Christ's sake. My prayer is that God will help me to get there, but I'm not there yet. And usually I pray and I thank God afterwards when, when the thing is past and God has entered in, or it's, it's gone away. Something's been removed. But how about in the moment? And this lesson is probably the hardest one for me, to be praying and praising God in the moment that something is happening. This is why I said I started my message with, blessed men go through valleys of weeping. It does not make you unblessed or not blessed by God to encounter problems, darkness, valleys, Trials, tribulations, it does not make you out of God's will, and it does not make you some oddity. In fact, if we could talk to each and every person just in this room alone, I'm sure we'd find out that there are more people that have gone through or are going through something that they would say, that's my thorn. And for that reason, I'd say to you, it's important for us to learn. Verse 11, he says, I am become a fool in glory. And glorying, you have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Why? Because they kept abasing him. So I can even add to this and say, if they kept saying, Paul's nothing, and you know, don't listen to him. His speech is terrible. It's contemptible. And look at his appearance. Every, everything that could be torn apart about the man these Corinthians were doing, And yet, I think because God blessed him with so many different experiences, the bulk of which, if you think about it, being able to have all this knowledge that one part of it from being a student that studied at the feet of Gamaliel and the other part of it having been tutored by Christ himself, one might say, well, you know, he's he's special. He's in a special group of people. Very few people have had that happen. And that could have made him become, well, I had an experience. I saw the third heaven. Uh, The Lord came to me and and spoke to me. Can you imagine if no one else had those experiences? (laughs) Right? It could happen. So that's why I said to you, it's important for us to get this right. So even, I'd go so far as to say, Um, when we talk about this thorn. And I've said the place of pain is the flesh, and the persistence of it is equally interesting. And I told you that word buffeting is continuous, present and active, mean ongoing. So my question is, if Paul is a chosen vessel of God, why would God let a messenger, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, buffet him? So the prescription for the Apostle Paul was exactly that, to keep him humble, lest he should be exalted, as as I've already covered. So if I were to say to you the persistence of this pain was a constant reminder that not only was God aware, but God would not 
one should not think it is because God's some killjoy, some cosmic freak show that just is cruel. But he knew what was best for the Apostle Paul. And most of the time, and now I'm speaking spiritually, most of the time we don't know spiritually what's best for us. In fact, most of the time we go against the grain of what's good for us spiritually because we're in the flesh, we live in the world, and we're greatly influenced by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lesser influences, until they become the greater, are the spiritual ones for someone who's starting out. So this is why anyone, any person today could say, yeah, I got something that's not going away, and I've asked God, but what is the purpose? What is the reason? Why would God do this? Can't God use another method? And as I've said, yes, he could. But this is the method he used. And it doesn't make sense for some people. They'll say, well, why do all this? Why? Because there's a promise in here. Actually, there's a couple of promises in here that let you know that even if you're going through something and you're struggling with something, God is saying, while you are in your struggles, there's something I will do for you. The promise of his strength, we read, strength is made perfect in weakness. The promise of his strength, he's saying when you finally, don't think about it in terms of empty yourself, but when you're finally emptied of yourself, think of it like a child. You know, I've used this before, but a child who gets punished, you know, when you cry and you cry and you cry and you cry, kids crying, at some point there's no more tears to be cried. It's all cried out, right? It's done. Think of it that way for our strength. When you come to the end of laboring to endeavor to extricate yourself out of your situation, you've been moving around so much that you've actually crippled yourself by not relying on God. And I, it, this reminds me greatly of a story that I read a long time ago that always it stayed with me, which is, I think it was a little boy caught he scooped up a cocoon and put it into a jar and brought it into his room and was waiting for whatever would come out of the cocoon. And the thing wasn't coming out of the cocoon. So he very gently he took one of his father's very sharp knives and split the cocoon to let the butterfly out. The only problem is that when whatever emerged came out, the child, unbeknownst to him, had basically ruined what nature would have done because it's in the process of coming out of the cocoon, the stretching to come out of the cocoon that straightens the wings that make the wings able to expand. But because he circumvented the process, that butterfly would never fly. And what I'm telling you spiritually is a lot of times we cripple ourselves by trying to extricate ourselves. We end up crippling our faith and not learning the lessons because we're so eager to extricate and get out, not recognizing that God's plan and design is one that is for you, not against you. You know, the prophet Jeremiah says, I have plans towards you that are for you, not against you. They're not designed to hurt you. So if we take this message and apply it properly, we could say that God is doing many times what we cannot see and what we don't understand and our petition for God to do it a certain way may just come unanswered because that's not God's way, that's man's way and God's ways and man's ways are different. Nevertheless, what I glean out of this for us today, if you are going through uh, a trouble, a trial, the thing that I glean out of this is that where Paul is right now in this chapter, being pressed down and weighted down, and seemingly, for most of us, we say being crushed. But no, he says, as this is all happening, he's gleaned strength from God. And that's what I want us to tap into. Strength that comes from our own. When somebody says, well, I'm, I'm, I feel strong, and I'm strong, and I'm able, look out. I mean, look out for that person. Because that person acting essentially in the flesh for spiritual things, is a train wreck waiting to happen. If you're going to do it God's way, don't try to bring your baggage and tell God how he's going to do it. You come in, sorry to say it, you come in the same way you're going to go out, and that's um, in a state of weakness 
You come into the world as a child in a state of weakness, and you leave the world in a state of weakness, bodily weakness, that is. But if we learn the lesson spiritually, we can approach a lot of our trials, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake, in a different light. Now, that's something, as I said, I'm still working on. So I'm telling you right now, I haven't arrived to the place of saying, yeah, every time some, some, something happens, I start rejoicing and saying, ha, ah, yay. It's like the price is right, except some bucket of dung was just dumped on me. Yay. Right? No. I told you, I'm still working on it. And I'm sure most of you are too. The thing is to not uh, give up and to understand there is an ultimate um, there is an ultimate word, a P word, to be placed on this passage, and that's peace. See, you'll never, and I, will never have peace until we settle something. God is not against you. God is not punishing you. God is not... Tor- the design is for something for you to learn, unless you're unteachable. We take that same lesson out of the potter and the potter's house. Unless you're that unteachable, that... God's tried, he's tried to mold you, and you refuse, you're not malleable. You will not let God's hand shape you and form you. You want to be what you want to be. And we know in the passage of Jeremiah 18 how God looks on that. And I'm saying to you, if you'll let yourself be molded by God, which includes the less pleasant things that could be to you and to me, peace. And that peace is important. See, I think until Paul came to the place of understanding this was necessary, he probably lived in great frustration about why God wouldn't. Then he settles the matter, and I believe peace came to him. And the answer from the Lord himself, my grace is sufficient for thee, that alone could have brought peace. But the whole lesson alone, I think, brings that mindset that says God is not trying to hurt me or to bring me down, but he is trying to transform me and to help me. And these things may just be, some onlooker may say, well, that's the cruelest thing I've ever heard. Is it? Or for the Christian, is it the greatest thing you've ever heard, that God cares enough about you to put you in the wine press? Because he knows that there is goodness to come out, but he also knows that there's things that must come out too, and only he can do that. And I think in the process... Some of us get like stuck pigs. We, we just want what we want, when we want it, blatant disregard that God may be working something out for us. And when? I'm going to speak for me. I can't speak to you because I don't know where you're at, but when will I learn the lesson? Hopefully sooner than later. What's the last thing I want to say on this before I bring this message to a close? Some of us may not have the buffetings or the same situation as Paul. Nevertheless, I'm going to say that the harsh blows of life can land on anybody, and they do. And I can tell you there are people in this room, I know most of you, who are going through things, whether it is conditions of sickness, some of you it's conditions of um, finances or the lack thereof. There's, you know, it's constant. It's chronic. Don't think that God has either forsaken you or forgotten about you. Maybe you are being pierced by some emotional, psychological buffeting. I really believe, if you want to know the truth, that's where most of us are. Most of us. The mind's an amazing uh, thing, but it also has the ability at times, if you really, and don't try to analyze yourself on this, but has the ability to put us into a mindset We're either a victim, we feel sorry for ourselves, we can turn everything in a different light, or we can look here and we can say, if Paul could say, I take pleasure in, I glory in, it's for Christ's sake, then I can take a page out of this and say, I'm I'm not there yet, but I am going to try as troubles come and as things do come my way to look and in the moment instead of saying, oh my God, why me and why this thing? Try to see the lesson that God is trying to show me, or in your case, to show you. And if we're open to it, that's the key thing. A lot of times we're not open to it. We don't want to hear. We don't want to see. It's not because we've articulated it. Our minds are closed to anything 
that God could actually be doing this because what we look for, we look for the God of the mountaintop, right? We look for God to do the spectacular in the most positive way. But what if God is entering into your situation beginning on a negative? I think that's where most of us begin. The mind is a battlefield. You've heard that said, and it's very cliche, but it's true. So you begin to learn the Bible, and there are times, I remember when I first started reading the Bible, I couldn't put the book down, but there were times when I did vacillate over, well, if, if this is that, how can I be that? Because I'm not that, and I could never be that. And you start going into this kind of circular uh, discussion, which then becomes insanity, rather than saying, God can. And if I'm being buffeted, if I'm in the process... I'll tell you who, who takes the biggest whackings in Christendom. Anyone who is committed with their heart to Christ. Anyone who looks to Christ and says, I could not live without my Lord and Savior. Those words alone, forget about, you know, people like to say, well, it's, it's the pastor, it's the leader. Yes, anybody who's in a more prominent position, the, the more prominent the position, I believe, the greater the target you become. But we're all targets. That's not to make people worry. That's to say, when you get to the point of recognizing, I said this last week, that neon sign is on your back. If, if you indeed are looking to Christ and you say, Christ is my all in all, you'll be buffeted by somewhere, some, some method. It might be, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm asking you to kind of think of this message and not just how I started, blessed men go through valleys of weeping, and they do go through, but sometimes we will encounter something like what I'm talking about today. And God says, no, I'm not going to remove it, but on the flip side, I haven't abandoned you, and I'm going to be with you all the way. And I believe in Paul's case, that's exactly what happened. Look at all the opportunities that were given to Paul right up until the time he's imprisoned, but even before that, to stand before political, influential people and tell them about the gospel and the answers that he got, at least from Agrippa, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. I think about while he was being buffeted, he was still going out and ministering to people and telling them about Jesus Christ. Why does it hinder us? Why do we draw back from these things? And I know this is actually the opposite of how we approach things normally, but why do we draw back so much? And why do we have such disdain? Because it's not pleasant. We only want pleasantries from God. Nothing else, right? Wrong. Because I'll take the buffeting. Now, I can't say this without putting a qualifier. I'll take the buffeting. If, if my mindset is saying, I'm looking to see what God is going to teach me out of this set of circumstances or out of this event or out of the multiple circumstances. I'm looking for the lesson God Open my eyes and help me to see it because I desire to see it. I want to grow spiritually. And if that's the mindset, there isn't any type of buffeting that will happen to you or to me that God is going to let get out of hand to the place of being uncontrollable or unbearable. Why? The Bible says there is no temptation known to man, but as such, anything that you might, be, you might encounter, God provides the way of escape, as well as the problem. He provides the answer or the solution if we're willing to take it. You know how many uh, solutions or the things that God has provided for us that people don't even touch, they don't look at, they don't even... Why? Because it seems like it is so hard to get there because it's the opposite of what we do in the flesh. And that's why we need to pay attention to what we should do in the spirit coming to these encounters. Um, so let me just say this to you. Today, if you are in that state, I don't want you to think God's against you. I don't want you to think that somehow you've been abandoned by God. And I, I really want this to settle in because I do recognize there's more, there's more mental buffeting. There's spiritual, there's physical, but there's more mental buffeting, I believe, that goes on within the body of Christ more trials that are fought, lost, or won in the mind because we either refuse to take the help or we refuse to see that it's God's work 
even if the buffeting comes from the devil, it's God's work to teach us something that we might become what he wants us to be. And I still, to this day, I don't know how the vast majority of Christianity that I've had exposure to, how do you become, how do you become an athlete? You train. You discipline yourself. How do you become a winning athlete? You get out there and you lose a couple of times. Maybe you lose a lot. And you have the spirit of someone who says, I will not I will not have defeat even if I lose. I'm still winning because I went out there and I put my effort. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey because I don't want people to think it's effort as in works. But I can take it back to the message and say, as long as I'm looking to Christ and asking for the help and looking for the place to understand how I will be changed, how spiritually this is for my good, it makes me think I can turn around and maybe I can't rejoice immediately right now in persecutions and distresses and all of that, but maybe I can turn around and say, God, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why this is happening. But you are in control, so I'm going to keep talking to you about it until you either sort it out for me, take it away, or let me understand this is my lot. And I believe with Paul, I believe he settled it. I believe he understood this was his lot. He would have this thorn until the day he died. Now, it doesn't sound that great. You know, it's not like you want to say, well, you know, uh, God's going to do all this stuff for me, and he's going to make my life perfect, and I'm going to be great, and I'm going to be awesome. Hello. Get real. Now, sometimes we pray, and we ask for things that are outside of God's design. And there's a place in the Psalms that talks about how the children of Israel finally wore God down, and he gave in to their request But what did he do? He sent leanness into their soul. I'd rather have a soul that is looking to God and filled with the idea and understanding of his love and care than to get what I want, exactly what I want, and have leanness sent to my soul to where I no longer feel as though I'm connected to him in the same way that I was. I'd rather take the buffeting. If God won't remove it, then have leanness. If I have to choose between the two and the knowledge that God cares enough about me or enough about you to send some type of buffeting, to send some type of corrective method or to send something to help me along in my faith walk, to to help me to grow, to better understand his way and his will. I am going to say it like this. It is hard to say, I'm going to boast and take pleasure in my infirmities. But maybe the next time, I'll get a little bit closer to the Apostle Paul. Maybe I won't say it immediately, but maybe after I've I've complained and opened my mouth for a minute or two, I might turn around and say, but the Lord's got my back. He'll take care of me. Because you know what? If I think about it, I'm grateful for the sicknesses that I've had. I'm grateful for the lessons that I can look at and say, unequivocally, that was God teaching me and showing me And I know I'm not finished. I know that there's a big road in front of me with more of these buffetings and more of these lessons. But instead of doing what I did at the outset 25 years ago, why me, Lord? How come? Why is this happening? This isn't fair. This isn't right. I now say, Lord, whatever it is, I know you. And I know you will not let deliberate harm for no reason at all come into my life. So I've said to you many times, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. I take it at his hand, and maybe in the future I can do what Paul has done. I don't know. I can't say. I'm I'm striving towards it, but I'm not there yet. Cut me a little slack for saying that and being honest with you. I'm not going to play the hypocrite and say, I do it. You should do it too. I highly doubt anybody's there saying when the stuff hits the fan, you say, I take pleasure in it. Yay! (laughs) But I thank God that he hasn't taken his hand off of me or his eyes off of me, and he hasn't taken his hand or his eyes off of you. What does the Bible talk about? He even sees the sparrow fall. So you mean to tell me he doesn't know the buffeting you're under right now? It says the hairs that are on your head, or the lack thereof perhaps, are numbered. That means he knows all about you and knows that you're being buffeted and going through something. And if you can take that perspective... It may just change the whole way you approach 
your buffeting and your problems. God is in control. God's got your back. It may not be the genie in the bottle. Poof, immediately you spoke and he came, but guess what? He is hearing you just as he's hearing me right now and hearing the silent thoughts and prayers of anyone who's in the sound of my voice saying, as I've said to you, my grace is sufficient. And you know what? That makes me a blessed person. It makes you a blessed person. And I go back to where I started. Blessed we are of God, and blessed though we are, we will go through trials, tribulations, and valleys. But guess what? We will come through, whether that's in God removing or God saying, no, but you stay the course and I'll be with you. Because that is the promise. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. I pray for those today who are grappling with this and who are trying to figure out why your prayers have not been answered. Don't be angry at God. Don't say God isn't there. Say God has other plans. And instead of trying to force your will on him, maybe we ought to start listening to his will and figure out what he wants of us. And it starts foremost with trusting him. I pray that be the case for you. And I hope that somebody in the sound of my voice has been encouraged and knows you are not out of God's will, that God loves you. And in fact, I'd say how much he loves that he would actually condescend to change, transform, and aid you into becoming what he desires you to honestly and earnestly be, to the image and likeness of Christ. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.